A great fiend for any school board. Lice can strike fear into the heart of parents and make even the most passionate insect lovers a little bit squeamish. But lice come in many forms. And are the parasitic ones even as scary as we make them out to be? Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the order Secodia, containing the bark lice, the book lice, and everyone's favorite, the parasitic lice. Most people have heard of lice, but many don't realize that lice, or the singular louse, can refer to any one of the 11,000 species found in this order. I'll be the first to admit it, this one's gonna be a little bit messy. Not too long ago, the parasitic lice were in their own order. So bark lice and book lice were called the Cicoptera, and parasitic lice were the Pithoraptera. But upon further analysis, the Pithoraptera seemed to be smack in the middle of the Cicoptera. So they were all combined into one order, the Cicodia. Cicodia seems to be closely related to the Hemipterans and the Thysanopterans, the true bugs and the thrips, though there is some debate there. As a general rule, lice are pretty small. They're all going to be under a centimeter long, sometimes even one or two millimeters. In terms of identification, I think it might be best to split this up into three segments. The bark lice, the book lice, and the parasitic lice. Bark lice have chewing mouth parts that they use to graze lichen, algae, or other plant or fungal matter. They have compound eyes and filiform thread-like antennae on roundish heads. They also have two pairs of wings that they hold like a tent over their body. Bark lice are often neutral colored, but can vary greatly in the patterning on the wings and body. Like the bark lice, book lice have chewing mouth parts, thread-like antennae, and compound eyes attached to bulbous heads. However, though bark lice can be anywhere from 2 to around 10 millimeters long, book lice are almost always in that 1 to 2 millimeter range. And perhaps even more obvious up close is that they lack wings. Okay, sometimes you can find some individuals in some species of the genus Embidosochus that do have wings. But in general, book lice are gonna lack wings. Book lice are also going to be somewhat flattened and a translucent whitish, grayish, brownish color. Hope that helps. Okay, so now the parasitic lice. Like the book lice, parasitic lice are wingless and flattened dorsoventrally, so they look normal from above and somewhat two-dimensional from the side. Parasitic lice, however, can have chewing mouth parts or sucking mouth parts. They're going to have claw-like appendages to help them grip onto hosts, reduced or absent eyes, and shorter segmented antennae. The parasitic lice are going to be mostly colorless or brownish. Lice as a whole are hemimetabolous, meaning they have an incomplete three-stage metamorphosis from egg to nymph to adult. So whether it's a bark, book, or parasitic louse, the nymphs are going to look somewhat like the adults, just always lacking wings. But let's go over the life cycles of each one of these one by one. Bark lice are free living out in their environment, so you can find them flitting about from time to time. The eggs are laid in bark crevices, on foliage, or in some safe, damp place. Once they hatch, the nymphs are going to feed on the same things the adults do. Lichen, algae, decaying plant matter, etc. Many bark lice are noted for being gregarious. They huddle together to keep safety in numbers from predators. Some bark lice take this a step further with the production of silk. Sometimes you can find trees seemingly coated in a fine layer of silk to shield the bark lice from potential danger. Once adults, the bark lice mate and lay eggs. One genus, the Neotragla, actually reverses mating roles. The female inserts an appendage called a gynosome into the male where it absorbs sperm and nutrients for egg production. The females take the mating initiative, while the males are much more selective. But most bark lice follow a more traditional mating structure. Females will then sometimes coat the eggs in debris or silk for protection, and the cycle continues. Now let's talk about book lice. Book lice are usually found in damp environments, feeding on mold and microscopic fungi anywhere they can find it. Pantries, bathrooms, and yes, book bindings. Hence the name. 
From egg to adult, it takes around a month or two. The nymphs and adults are gonna feed on the same thing and just go where the food is. Okay, now the big one, parasitic lice. I'm gonna try to keep this video under 10 minutes. Parasitic lice have diversified themselves across a wide variety of hosts. Some specialized on just a single species. However, most lice are going to be parasites of birds. Parasitic lice can either be chewing lice or sucking lice. Chewing lice feed on fur, feathers, and skin secretions, while sucking lice are blood-focused. Chewing lice can be found on birds or mammals, while sucking lice are only found on mammals. The story begins with female lice gluing their eggs to fur or feathers. These eggs are often referred to as nits. Once the nymphs hatch out, they'll feed on the same things the adults do, and after about a month or so, they'll molt into their adult form, and it's their turn to mate and lay eggs. Parasitic lice can host hop when two potential hosts come into close contact with one another. But some lice practice phoresis, which is where one species disperses by hitching a ride on another species, such as a fly. As a whole, though, the Sakodia lay eggs, the nymphs hatch, the nymphs eat the same things the adults do, the adults mate, lay eggs, cycle continues. Some lice skip that mating part, though, as lice are another group of insects where you can find parthenogenesis, where females can lay perfectly viable, unfertilized eggs. We haven't even talked about how lice affect us as humans yet, so let's dive into it. There are three main species of lice that feed on humans. Head lice, body lice, and pubic lice. Head lice don't really transmit any diseases. They are still a nuisance, and you should not keep them around, but they don't pose much of a threat. Body lice, however, do spread multiple diseases, such as trench fever, louse-born relapsing fever, and sylvatic typhus. The latter two only really are going to occur in areas with severe overcrowding and poor living conditions. And even then, they can be readily knocked out with antibiotics. But that is the typhus that you've read about in your history books that killed millions of people. It's just with sanitation and antibiotics, we can handle it a lot better. Pubic lice, also known as crabs, don't spread diseases either. But they can be itchy. And although we often talk about them in the context of STIs, they can also be spread by the sharing of clothing and bedding. And before we leave this topic, head lice do not prefer dirty hair. Anyone can catch lice, dirty or clean. However, regularly showering and washing clothing and bedding can really help to prevent and treat body lice, hence their prevalence in areas without good sanitation. Bark lice are never really a pest. Book lice can get into homes, but if that happens, that just means you've got some mold growth somewhere. Fix the humidity and get rid of the mold and they'll go away on their own. Besides, all they really do is munch fungi, so there's not really even a threat there. On the contrary, bark and book lice are great little custodians of their environment. Cleaning up mold, lichen, and anything else they find on the tree, leaf litter, or any other area they call home. In terms of conservation, Let's not really worry about the parasitic lice right now. Parasites are an important part of their ecosystem and they help keep things in check, but one of the best ways to conserve parasitic groups is to conserve their hosts. So let's just focus on that for right now. To create healthy populations of bark lice on your property, you often need mature trees to provide not just habitat, but also the lichen and fungal growths in which the lice feed. Just remember to plant trees native to your area. Many bark and book lice also live in leaf litter, so try to conserve it each season. If you have to relocate it to certain areas on your property, that's fine, just don't get rid of it. Leaf litter is its own little ecosystem teeming with life, and the lice are gonna appreciate you leaving some real estate for them. Oh, and before I forget, the name Sokotia is derived from the Greek word sokos, which means gnawing or rubbed. So Sokotia roughly means insects that gnaw, which kind of ignores the whole sucking lice group, but, you know, close enough. Anyways, that's all I got for you today, so thank y'all for listening, and please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future content. And if you have any lice stories or any fun lice facts I didn't cover, uh, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear about them. Peace, y'all.